now before before we start um, proper um, and Ross, if you don't mind, allow me a few minutes to just kind of like situate this uh, the purpose of this uh, this session uh, and the intentions. So so f first and foremost, right? Um, I just wanted to say, um, people like Ros, uh, one of the more valuable guests, and and the reason is because she's in this space, you know, in compliance, which is a very very popular but also a very very growing space, and we get a lot of um, inquiries about um, how to get into it and and so on and so forth, right? And uh, before this session, I was uh, you know, two weeks ago. I did a quick search on uh, my career's future to just to see how many roles there are with the title of compliance. And back then, it was like two hundred fifty jobs with the title compliance. And then yesterday, I did the same thing. I saw three hundred, closer to three hundred jobs listed on my career's future when I searched for compliance. Now, I'm not saying that it's going to go up and up every time I check, but I think the point I'm trying to make is that. Um, uh, roles in this space are still growing. And I, I also have read uh, certain reports by companies like McKinsey, Deloitte, Accenture that also substantiate the fact that this is a growing um, um, uh, sector, this space, um, due to, you know, the technological changes and as a result, you know, increased, you know, a, a more complex environment. Lah. So in my humble opinion, Ross, and you can, you can chime in later, Compliance is very big, right? There, there's at least four subsectors. There's central compliance, there's regulatory compliance, there is support function compliance. And Roslyn uh, handles or is part of this 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 other silo, which is the FCC or financial crime, which is also very big. So my hope uh, for this session is um, that the the things that we share and the things that we're about to talk about uh, is not going to be help, not just going to be helpful for folks who are interested in the space, but also provide the the logic uh, and uh, career advice um, that is applicable even outside of you know uh, roles within the space. Now, yeah. So I guess you know without further ado, I just want to say, Ross, thank you so much for investing this time. Oh, last thing, I also want to say, uh, Ross is here in a personal capacity as an IBF fellow, so her opinions are hers alone. Yeah. So. <laughs> I protect you. Okay. okay. So with, without further ado, Ross, uh, thank you very, very much for uh, for joining us today. Thank you, Adrian. And thank you, IBF Careers Connect. Um, I am always happy to join a conversation about compliance and especially AML. Um, because as you as, as we go through, you will realize uh, I feel very strongly and very passionate about what I'm doing. And I hope to convey that same passion and the same interest to those who are thinking of, hmm, should I do a role in compliance or not, you know? That's it, that's yeah. It. That's why you're valuable. Okay, well, there's <laughs> one more thing that I want to tell everybody here uh, in the audience, that um, if you have any questions, please use the Q&A function that you can see below, uh, and we'll, uh, we will try our very best to answer uh, as many uh, many uh, as many of those questions as we possibly mm -hmm. can, given the time that we, uh, that we might have, now, okay? Um, but otherwise, uh, this is the cheeky thing that I want to say. I'm going to apply a KYC exercise on you, Ross, right now. Uh, so <laughs> we're going to get to know you a little bit better. Um, and as as is tradition, uh, we normally try to find out a bit more about uh, the guests or tell people about your, your background. A lot of the times when we talk to job seekers, right, um, one of the things that we, we, we discover is that many people have a plan, but uh, life intervenes and their plans get changed and so on and so forth. So I want to talk about your life. Um, so obviously, ex-lawyer, ex-litigator, uh, moved to compliance. Tell us about, um, uh, you know, was it always something that you wanted? To, was law something you always wanted to get into as part one? And then part two would be, how did you make and why did you make that switch into compliance? Okay. All right. A short bio, a short history, of Ross. Yeah, yeah, okay. Yeah. Um, I actually am a medical uh, student. I, mean, I wanted to be a medical uh, school uh, candidate and I, I'm rejected mm. because of the uh, quarter in NUS Medicine, School of Medicine. Mm. So they gave me a second choice, which is law. And they say, be happy. It's law, <laughs> which is also a very good profession. And I'm like, really? I'm a science student. I don't really like law because, you know, the law is always very adversarial. Mm. I, I'm not that kind of person. But guess, guess what? As you say, life always gives you an interesting turn. And I took, I given, I took law and I became a, 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 a legally trained lawyer, practitioner for several years, both in private and uh, public sector work. Mm -hmm. And the thing about law is that it teaches you to think. It teaches, it teaches you to think uh, about risk. 
and not just about how to win or how to fight a battle, but how do you manage and re reach the outcome in your, of course, in, in the case of law, mm. in the best outcome for your client, whether it is litigation or conveyancing or contract or anything, how do you achieve the outcome that the client wants and how do you apply your skill set? So law was very, very valuable when it came to uh, managing that, that discipline and the rigor of, let me think, how do I achieve this outcome for my client? Okay. So I was doing law for, I can't say, but many, many years. Okay, like 14 years. Lah, okay. And then I realized law was too adversarial for me. It was just too much of a battle because I'm a litigation. I was a litigation lawyer, which means I had to go and fight in court every other day and every other week. And it was taking a toll on me because I felt it was, not, it was too adversarial. And there was no real opportunity to actually mediate a win-win a negotiated settlement. Um, people were very entrenched in their positions. You are wrong, I'm right. And they will never see the middle ground. So I realized that law, I was just adding fuel to the fire in this way that we were just all lined up in battle. So I decided as a mid-career switch, I mean, instead of getting a Harley Davidson bike, I decided to change my career. Okay. So I decided, what can I do that will uh, that will teach me, that will allow me to use my skill as a lawyer, a litigation lawyer. But having not having to go to court, so I tried to reinvent myself. And as opportunities do come far in between, there was one opportunity when my ex client asked me, "Hey Ross, can you join my newly set up AML KYC TTM unit?" And I said, and I really thought it was a code, and I didn't know what the code was. AML KYC TTM because <laughs> this is finance, this is financial industry, mm. and I just didn't know what to do. But I went on faith, and I said, "Listen, I the person on the other side was willing to teach, mentor." Say, listen, all you need to know about AML, KYC, TTM, I will teach you. But I just need someone willing to learn, willing to apply their skill set, and willing to put in the hours. So I walked. I actually walked from law, crossed the road, and went into a, a, a bank and say, here I am. Use me as a AML, KYC, TTM compliance officer. And since then, I've never looked back. So I've always been doing AML, KYC, TTM. And, uh, and, and the interesting thing is, from medicine, which I wanted to do, to law, which I did, and now I'm in banking and doing compliance. It's been quite a fascinating journey, but the important thing is the opportunities will come far in between, but seize the opportunity and take a leap of faith. That's what I'll say. Take a leap of faith, you know? I'm sorry, right. Adrian. Oh, sorry. Yeah, so sorry, sorry. Yeah, I yeah. said that's really, really very interesting. Um, because one of the things that I'm I'm picking out on that, and and I think the way you describe it, um, a lot of people aspire for that to happen mm. to them in that sense because um, most oftentimes the way you describe it is very linear, right? It's very linear. Mm. It means to say like, oh, when Ross wants something, it happens, right? For most people, it doesn't happen that way, uh, because um, if you if you don't have any, you know, uh, it's harder for them, like Basically, you know, to to say, okay, I'm a lawyer now, and then hey, someone has invited me. To mm -hmm. go and join, people don't invite most of the kids. I mean, like yeah. people that were with it, they don't get invited, right? So, so mm -hmm. what do you think are uh, or were some of the inherent things that made you so? I don't know what the word is, maybe likable or you know, like uh, people people want to give you the chance, give you the opportunity, you know. Um, what 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 do you owe? Um, what do you owe? It, what do you owe it to? You know, what 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 is the okay. the, the, the skill set or what you know? Yeah. As I said, it was my ex-client, okay? So, which means he had seen me work in an environment where we were being practical, we were temperate, and we were logical. So, as lawyers uh, acting on their client's case, they were, they saw us, they saw us how we were able to manage, as I say, outcomes, how we were able to achieve that outcome for them. So, in a sense, I think it is the ability to, create the solution, the ability to go through the process of creating the solution is what is required in a, in a role, whether it is compliance or even new products or business development, is what can you offer without saying you have a problem, but what's the solution? Because you know, you if you don't provide the solution or capable of saying, I see your problem, let me say what I can bring to the table to help you achieve that solution. So. I think that's where the connect was. When when my ex uh, client came to me and said, Ross, I don't know anyone in Singapore because he's an American. So he says, but I have the opportunity to set up the unit in Singapore in this bank. Mm. 
since I only know you and your senior partners and I cannot get them over, can I get you over and we'll do it together because we have a problem. Mm. What can you, and I know what you can deliver. I'll teach you the skills. So the rubrics of doing the work that comes on the job, but what do you bring to the table? It's what is important for the, for the employer, whether invited or not, you know what I mean? Yeah. I, I mean, that's very useful because what you described uh, is, for example, if I if I were to parallel the thing into like some a portion of the people that we deal with, people who are currently in jobs right now, uh, and the question is, how do I move into something? How do I, how do I uh, pivot into something else within the company, right? And I think the way you described it, from what I hear, is like you need to prove what you have, mm-hmm. la, and then you need to prove what you have. But at the same time, you need a receiver mm-hmm. to also think, you know, a little bit a little bit broader on whether or not you know, you are, you are, you, 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 you fit, you know, as in like, yeah. they, they have to think a bit more. Okay. Correct. So that's one thing, but then how about folks um, who, for example, don't have the luxury of that network? Cause you, you got that, you got that switch because of the network, people, people know you, but what do you think mm-hmm. about folks who say, who don't have such a network, right? And, uh, and they are, they are attempting to do this um, uh, pivot or they're trying to move into, specific things uh, like, you know, compliance, for example, what do you think the best thing for them to do could be, uh, you know? Um, yeah. What, what do you, what do you think uh, the best thing for them could be? Well, two things, as you mentioned, one is what is the transferable skills? Mm. What do I already have in my pocket? What do I have it in my bag, you know, that I can transfer. And the second thing is also to reinvent ourselves. That means I am not a lawyer, legally trained, or I'm not a banker who has been uh, servicing clients. I'm not a loan officer. How do I become a compliance officer? How do I reinvent myself? So a part of it would be the learning. I'm not talking about just diplomas and certifications. It's to show that uh, willingness and commitment to reinvent myself. That means I committed to reinvent from a lawyer, litigation lawyer fighting in court to a back room, back uh, what they call a a cost center to advise my RMs and my advice, my banker on how to manage AML risk. Now, it is a very, and for that kind of reinvention and that kind of recommitment, you need to invest in yourself first. Okay. Mm. Um, go for the learnings. Okay. And 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 go for the what is what is current in that particular area that you want to break in. What is mm. topical? What is keeping the CEO alive, uh, of sleep, uh, not asleep, awake? You know, what is <laughs> yeah. it that you no, know, what yeah. is it that he's gonna say, oh my god, oh my god, oh my god. It doesn't have to be AML, it can be anything. It could be as you as you were talking about it, technology. What is it that I can even bring into a space like technology advancements? What can I do in terms of even digitalization? What can I do in the field of data analytics? These are not compliance issues, but they are so topical. Every other day is artificial intelligence, artificial intelligence. Do I even know what artificial intelligence is? I don't know. I didn't know and I still don't know, but I've, I've started to read up about it. I'm starting to, 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 to attend webinars, seminars. Even some of my colleagues, some of my team members are even taking courses on mm. data analytics. And they're all compliance officers. So, but you see, you need to embrace the new newness and then acquire the knowledge and then put it on a CV or put it in some cover note and say, guys, you need me because I have both transferable skills and I know how to reinvent myself and I know how to bring it to the table because I know what is the problem statement that you have. Or even if you don't have a problem statement, this is the value I'm going to add to you and your organization. So yeah. reinvent yourself, reinvent ourselves, you know? Yeah. I think that's, uh, again, also very, uh, very um, important, like what you mentioned. Mm-hmm. So if I were to summarize the takeaways, right? I mean, you can correct me for a moment or add. The advice you always give people uh, is obviously to... Um, make yourself visible, but at, at the same time, invest in yourself, like what you mentioned, right? Mm-hmm. If you have gaps, you should try to plug those gaps. Mm-hmm. But after you've plugged those gaps, or, you know, simultaneously, you need to showcase yourself mm-hmm. um, to willing receivers mm-hmm. to say that, hey, look at me, you know, mm-hmm. I, I am I am like this now. I'm current, I'm hip, whatever it might, you know, might, mm-hmm. might be. Uh, would you take a chance on me? So I guess the two things, investing in yourself, but also... Ex- investing in relationships externally, right? Uh, yes. People, yeah. So, so two things, that, uh, and and I'm really glad that, that that you mentioned it because that's what I'm taking away from what you mentioned. Now, mm-hmm. 
there was one other thing that I again this is not rehearsed, uh, guys. Uh, people mm, yeah, who are sure. here, I'm not I'm not rehearsed. I haven't rehearsed with Ross, so I want to know about this now. If you looked at Ross' LinkedIn profile, uh, I don't know whether it's gonna dredge your bad memories or whatever memories. Yeah, are. Okay. You you spent a bit of time in a very famous crypto, right? Now I want to find mm. out was that also through a network or what? I mean, how did you how did you do that? How 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 did that happen? Because again. When people look at your profile, that would probably be one of the things that stand out. It's like, my gosh, how did she how did she do this? You know, from you know, very traditional firms into whoa, mm. this, you know, this how did that happen? Okay. Uh basically is uh, based on my already existing relationship. Okay, my, so the relationship. my yeah, my head of compliance from my mm. traditional bank moved into that crypto uh, company. And he needed someone with AML experience. Mm. So he called me up and says, why don't you join me? So I say it's a testament to the fact that we have worked together for five years. Uh, he has seen my abilities. He has seen uh, what value I bring to the table at a, in a traditional bank. And then he says, come over. And, and, and both of us are green. So, and that's why would, he said, listen, Mr. Ross, it's green field. Both of us can, can go in. This is our proposition. We will redo or we will we will make a mark. Let's go and redo the, the policies. I'll take care of non-AML. You can rewrite the whole suite, suite of, of AML procedures and policies. So we went in not knowing anything about crypto except that it's crypto. And I don't even know how to spell crypto. Okay, never mind. That's a different word. But never mind. Is it R Y O I? Okay, whatever. So I went in bringing in my traditional skills of what is AML, 101, 102, 201, whatever. I know what is AML in a traditional bank, in a traditional FI. I'm now going into a crypto space, which is greenfield, and how do I transfer that skill set to a new and funky magic guys that talk tech every other day and you have no idea what they're talking about. You know what I mean? Because as you know, lawyers and compliance officers are the worst for technology and we are technophobes. So to go in there to... And to take on was a challenge. And I and I was there for so, but maybe less than a year. But what I did was I created policy. I created policy, AML policies and procedures for the for that institution mm. because I was able to understand what was that particular risk. How was it same, same, but, but different? different. Yeah. yeah, same, same, but different. But so different. that's 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 the that again, the transferability, the application and the reapplication of what I know and the value that I bring to the table. So ask yourself, if suppose someone tells you now, can you come and join this newly set up company? Can I? Can you Can you come in and do one, two, three, four, five? Ask yourself, what will I be bringing to that organization? And can I deliver one, two, three, four, five? Okay. Some of it will be based on your traditional skill set. Some will be, I will learn, I will acquire. You know what I mean? And first thing I'll find out is, what's the difference between fiat and crypto? Okay. <laughs> Yeah. Now, but you see, once you get that right, you will understand everything else. The, <laughs> because everything else, I'm very convinced that the certain things don't change. The foundational principles don't change. The risk management principles don't change. That's why I say it's same, same. But what is different? The delta. Yeah. Acquire that skill set before or even during the job and deliver. Deliver. That's what I would yeah. say. So mm -hmm. here's the here's the third thing then I I I would summarize from from this. So just now we covered two things, which is uh, mm -hmm. invest in self, which means growth, uh, plugging gaps. Next thing would be the value of a, a strong network and people that mm. believe in you. Like now, you just mm. again reiterated the, the the importance of that. Mm. Uh, you know, by by way of getting into this uh, uh, this crypto due to your relationships. That's again. Oh, to the people out there, I mean, we can't emphasize it enough. You you mm. need to, people need to know. It's not about who you know, it's about who knows you. That's what we like to say, yeah. right? Mm. But then the third thing is, I think this one, what I'm getting is um, a little bit more towards like the, for the mid-careers. A lot of mm. people that IBF careers work, mm. uh, when we work with, they are very mid-careers, which means to say mm. they are not like fresh grads. Mm. We have some fresh grads and we welcome for whoever is out there who's interested in talking to us. Uh, but the the bulk of our population are very mid career flavor, which means they have like the decade or more of experience in something. So I think the third thing that I would I would take away from like what like from what you just said mm. is um, maybe not a, a full reinvention of the wheel. The wheel, mm. the shape of the wheel, still still similar, Stay. but build build on it as yeah. in like 
build on those skills. Like, because I think for a full reinvention, if you're a mid careerist, let's say if you've if you spent 10 years in compliance, for example, and you say, hey, you know what, I want to become a pharmacist. I mean, that's a full reinvention and yep. that will not come easy. Nothing's impossible, mm-hmm. but obviously they will come easy. But then for a lawyer to compliance, it is a reinvention, but there are foundational things that you just mentioned that you can build on. Mm. So that's what I'm taking. That's what I'm taking away. Like for example, you may not have been in a crypto, but there are some foundational things that yep. you have that you had that mm. you could build on, that you could bring into the thing, even however greenfield it is. So I think that's mm. the third thing that I want to reiterate to everybody. You know, three things, right? So far, maybe we get four, five, six um, as as we progress uh, in our conversation. But it's also a very, very good point especially for mid-careerists, because unless you're willing to give up a lot, you know, mm. start from the bottom again, earning very little money and things like this, for a full reinvention, no? like compliance to pharmacy or compliance to astronaut or whatever it might be, right? It's a huge, it's a huge leap. But I think the the, the general advice we normally try to give people at, at this sort of like um, experience level is to try to be better, right? Mm. Be better. Um, yeah, so so thanks thanks for that one as well. Um. The way that this conversation is going, I normally ask all these questions at the end, <laughs> but, mm-hmm. but but uh, I just follow the flow. So uh, coming back again to um, your experience in uh, you know in AML uh, in mm-hmm. in this in this uh, silo, mm-hmm. right? I want to find out, you know, um, having been in the space for such a long time, right? Um, um, and of course, you know, you don't have to reveal any secrets, but I, I want to I want to take a retrospective in terms mm. of back when you started, right? And 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 now, were there any differences between the banks that you work uh, that you that you work with in terms of style, culture, you know, skills and things like that? That was so sort of like very important back then, but then less important now. And if it's less important now, what has taken over in terms of the importance? Do you, do you see the what what I'm trying to ask? Yeah, but um, please. Fortunate for me, since I've been, always been now in AML for the past mm. 16, no, 17 to 18 years I've been yeah, in AML. Yeah, yeah. Nothing really has changed. AML continues to be high on the regulatory focus. Mm. Um, the, 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 that's right, found the foundational principles of AML just getting keeps keeping and being entrenched. Mm. You just have to show the ability to adapt to the new risk that is emerging. The new risk, so, yeah. Yep. The new risk that is emerging. So, for example, let's just, just talk about something very AML, okay? Uh, golden passports. So, we know what are golden passports, right? Because now we see the Project Cerulean, which is the Fujian gang, uh, uh, AML uh, breaking news in Singapore since last August. Yeah, yeah. We now come to the fore that there are customers of the bank or the financial institution who may be carrying more than one passport. They have, in some cases, five passports, but no one is going to tell you, yeah, I've got five passports. Yeah, they are. No one will tell you that. But still, how do you manage that emerging risk? What do you do? How do, will the bank or a financial institution now manage this new risk that is emerging? That there are clients who could be ethnically born, raised, and domiciled in one country, but who may be carrying more than one passport. So this goes back to CDD, as you say, customer due diligence, KYC. What can the bank or financial institution do, or even non-financial institution, to get some kind of assurance that the client is, the passport is what they say. So we have to think about a solution. We've got to think about a control, a measure, and then try and implement it. So something very small like that. And so the, the, the principle is still the same, KYC. But when the emerging risk comes in, how do we respond to that? Mm. Another example would be these newly minted companies. I love to call them the newly minted companies, where you have newly set up companies, three months or less, or six months or less, or even twelve months or less, but operating outside a operating outside a the, the shareholder bills um, condominium or outside a registered office in with a with a uh, CSP in uh, in international plaza for let's say. But they have fund flows which are wow. Too much, too big. Surely, is that Normal. kind of consistent with the client's profile? Yeah. You're a newly set up company. You haven't even set up your freaking office. You are working outside your condo, and maybe next to your swimming in the next to the swimming pool, and yet you are moving X of millions or X hundred thousands and Y hundred thousands of millions in. Those are the kind of risk. How are we managing it? How are we going to uh, get in front of that new risk? So new things come. But they just basically test the foundation. 
So whether it is business, as you say, whether it's business compliance, product compliance, uh, regulatory compliance, or, or any type of compliance, mm. the principles are always the same. It's just the application to the new fact situation, the new risk situation. Got it. Got it. And 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 so when you're talking about this, right? I want to find out. Um, in response to this potential new risks, for example, right? Um, and 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 this goes into like um hiring of people. Mm. Obviously, you know, hiring a compliance person to a compliance role will be easiest. But then, yes. all right, like say, let's say in your space, like FCC, for example, or like financial crime, for example, um. I'm going to say, because I've seen it before, I've seen like um, CID officers and police officers, they, they made the transition inside. Mm-hmm. What sort of other profiles do you feel uh, could be quite interesting who are not com- who are not coming from compliance um, or, or, or law even, right? You're know, just trying to be narrow it mm-hmm. down, make it difficult for you. Huh? Um, what sort of other profiles do you think, right, um, would be quite suitable, you know, um, from a mindset perspective, from a, you know, from a regular perspective, huh, would be good to get into the the compliance space, you know what I mean. I mean, this is this question just feeds into. I don't know who's mm. attending. I don't know what their backgrounds are right now and the participants here, but I want to find out what do you think are the, some of the really strong potential backgrounds um that could make this pivot a bit people, easier than say you know from a pharmacy yeah. to you know yeah. yeah people who are already doing or have done quality assurance work, QA, people yeah. who have done testing, monitoring. It doesn't matter what the subject is. Mm. If, even as you say in a pharmacy, all right, your job is to check whether the drugs are overdue or expired. You know what I mean? Mm. There is a protocol. There is a protocol and they ensure that that protocol is abided with. Or even in the NTUC to make sure that uh, the chicken that has expired doesn't remain on the shelf. You know what I mean? Yeah. You know, it, it could be something as mundane and as, wow, really? How is that compliance? But that is compliance because yeah. the regulatory standard is thou shall not put expired goods on the shelf. Yeah, Correct. People, yeah, so yeah. if you say I, I've only been testing their life a day, a live uh, sell by date for chickens, that still can be transferred. That can still be transferred to compliance because that is what compliance is. Yes. It's regulatory of compliance, it's adherence to a standard. You see? Yeah. So try not to be so narrow to say, oh my god, it has to be uh MA626, it has to be outsourcing regulations. No. What is again? I say, what is the risk that you're managing? You know, yeah. what is yeah. the risk that you're managing, and how have you been doing it in your organization, mm. and how can you transfer that to a bank, maybe a fintech company, mm. or even to a pharmacist? Okay. Pharmacist uh, oper- operations. Now you yeah. now you're gonna get it ready because now <laughs> as in like okay okay so. That's really good. And I don't know how many, again, I don't know how, how, how many radical profiles we have who are very different, right? Who are in the mm. session right now. But I want to ask this question on behalf of those people, right? Mm. So some the people who are currently working in NTUC or pharmacies, they'll be like, come on, come on, seriously, I'm going to apply for this job. And I'm not. So let's say you are the hiring manager right now and this person has applied for a, a role, let's say an email, mm. or whatever it might be, right? Mm. Um, how are you going to view this person how are you going to view this cv of someone who's worked in ntuc um checking sell by dates or you know a pharmacist how are you going to um, look and, and say you know what you know what i want to give this person a chance I, I want to i want to give this person a call have my hr person give a call for this person because ah, fill in the blanks because of what i mean what what would you be looking for as a hiring manager or someone who looks at resumes and who is potentially looking to hire. And remember that the roles are very precious, right? Because like if, yeah, yeah, if your, your organization is very like hiring two, two people, you want to get the right people. But then what mm-hmm. will make you take that first steps in, in looking at a so-called radical or very different um, um, CV? Okay. For mm-hmm. me, mm-hmm. I am I will always give a person a chance, but I also want people to come in with the correct expectations. Mm-hmm. Okay. Um, to say, listen, I have done 10 years of NTUC QA and I want a even a permanent role or I want a VP role or an SVP role because that's what I was. I don't know, the equivalent in NTUC may be a bit stretched because, you see, I compliance or any other your employer may not have the opportunity to Let's let's come, let's let's train you from day one. I need people to hit the ground running. Mm-hmm. But the good point about AI, compliance, especially in AML, is a lot of the roles they they cover the very 
almost monotonous, mundane, day in, day out, pipeline kind of work like TM alert reviews, name screening alert reviews, transaction screening alert reviews, yeah. CDD reviews. They're all these very, very almost, I hate to use the word, same thing every day. You clear 10 files, you got another 10 more coming in. You clear 100 alerts, another 100 for probably in the pipeline. Those kind of work, if you are agreeable to do it, even though they're very junior roles, but you said, this at least gets a toe in, I would consider you, okay? But the other thing is also be prepared to accept even a contract board. A lot of banks, especially now, have overdues in TM, transaction monitoring alerts, mm. CDD, customer due diligence review alerts, periodic review especially. Mm. Maybe transaction screening, baby name screen. I don't know, that's, that is backlogs galoring everywhere. Mm. They will usually want to hire contractors. But then you have people say, I, I don't want a contract role because there is no security. There is no uh, maybe full medical benefits. But my point is this, guys, you're doing a career switch. You need to be kind of willing to take a step back and say, listen, I will stomach six months of just medical reimbursements and forego because I have a better health insurance plan outside the outside my work. Mm -hmm. And I'm, I will take a six-month contract or a one-year contract just to get the toe in. That's what I, yeah. I will look for. The, the the enthusiasm as well as the attitude, you know, and not say, hey, I am so wonderful. Give me a job. I'm like, yeah, thank you. You're really wonderful <laughs> in NTUC, but why would I want to take a risk on you? And and the other thing is, this is more for the for employers, not for the employees. Mm. I always want to give the more, uh, what they call mature uh, worker, a chance because it's very difficult for, for these people to break into a new Agreed. industry. Yeah. So usually, I have someone who applied who's 26 years, one role only in another bank, credit operations. But she said, I want to do AML. I said, counted her age. Well, okay, la, she's, she, this could be a year of a dragon for her, you know? So she's really going to be plus six. She's going to be 60. But I gave her a chance. Why? Because she was enthusiastic. She was willing to learn from the bottom and it was a contract role. Why not? It's no, no skin off my nose because I've got a willing, a willing body to do some work and in that process, they are learning and I am judging, I'm assessing. Yeah. And then I can say, all right, worthy servant or worthy steward, I will now grant you either a renewal of a contract or permanent conversion. Yeah. Because yeah. I have seen you on the job. I think that's important. Get your foot in, get your toe in, you know what I mean? So I think, again, it's it's also, I mean, when when like what you're saying, right, I, I do see it is almost like a cost-benefit thing. And it's mm. basically when you say you want it, it's how bad you want it, right? Mm. Because at the end of the day, if you if you if the op, op if the option or the opportunity is like say, okay, I need I need like uh 50 name screeners or whatever it might be, or I need I need like a bunch of people who are doing this mm. day in and day out, right? Mm. I mean the 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 proof is in the pudding of what you say that you want is the willingness to accept it, regardless of how how cyclical the, the role is, how repetitive the role is, right? Um, mm. In order for you to get a chance in and then maybe kind of like move your way internally and so on and so forth. Would you, would you agree that? As in like, yeah, that's, that, that's the, the proof in the pudding, like, basically, right? Yeah, it's, it's, yeah it's, it's what you that say is, you want. Yeah. That is progression. That is career progression, but must be willingness to start from the bottom. Mm. I didn't tell you that when I went to the bank, I gave up equity partnership in the law firm mm. to become a vice president. And the, when you see the bank, you'll know when you went, well, I won't tell you the name of the bank, but in that bank, everyone is a vice president. <laughs> I mean, everyone's a vice president. It they, is one they, of them. They see your background already. They see your, yeah, like, know. Your... Yeah, they'll know that I was a vice president. But I was willing to take that, 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 that what I call that, that hack cut as well as the loss in stature, you know, to say, because I'm going to learn something, AMLC, KYC, TTM, you know, I was going to learn something. I was given an opportunity to, 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 to really do something different and add value. So what if the if the rank is no not a uh, atas rank? You know what I mean? I was one of the many VPs, but slowly but surely built myself to SVP. That's all. That's all I got in that in that shop, in that bank. But I yeah. was okay because for me the rank didn't matter. It was the work that mattered for me. I enjoyed what I was doing. I was learning and I was contributing. And I think okay. most of us should have. I mean, not most of us allowed because some people say, Ross, I got a mortgage. I agree. You have a mortgage. You gotta feed your kids, bring them to send them to university. Cost benefit, uh, right? Yeah. Yeah. Work yeah. out. Yeah. What what is your point where you can say, I can stick this and because I want something else? 
I want that opportunity to to showcase my talent or to yeah. transfer my skills or reinvent yeah. myself. So it's there. The opportunities are there, you know. Yeah, exactly. Um, again, uh, this is just reiteration mm-hmm. of people who yeah. are who are thinking about this. There's always something to get if you're willing to give something. I, yeah. I suppose, right? Yeah. There's no, no kick and eat it like, most of the time. Yeah. Okay, and and so I want to come back again to the NTUC and the pharmacy yeah. profiles, right? Okay, mm-hmm. so this person has been doing this for a while. I want to talk about um, additional ammunition that this person can use to signify his or her intention that hey, look, I'm serious. Look, I've been i I've, I've been doing chicken cell by dates for like mm. last ten years or eight years, mm. but then I've taken this course. You know, yes. I, I've done this. Yes. I've shown. I want to. I want to talk a little bit. I will just pause here and uh, and 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 sort of talk about upskilling. You know, like mm. for me as a person, when I think about taking courses, right? Um, obviously it's it's self improvement, but also the other the other beneficial thing is the signal that it sends to employers. Yeah, right? agree, that, agree. Like, you know, I, I I have sweated for the last nine months to take this and yeah. I wouldn't, you know, and, and this is a testament to my determination to get into FCC or AML, right, mm-hmm. for example, right? Let's talk about courses. Um, um, I don't know whether you can answer this, um, but uh, what sort of courses should our friends who are in the audience who are thinking of making the signal or showing the signal to employers um, what do you think would be very useful things uh, for them? I mean, and, and feel free to answer from a, you know, a, a, a big broad compliance thing like ICA diplomas or ACAMS or whatever it might be or CAX 1-2 for private bankers or whatever it might be. But also just, just in general, what would you, uh, are there any things that you would endorse? Like you, you can't go wrong with X, Y, and Z, you know? that, that kind Okay. Of, yeah. As I said just now, you can't go wrong with data analytics. That's the biggest buzzword. Data and analytics, yeah. Not even, because not even compliance. But, but not even compliance. Data, yeah, that's data, great. data yeah, and okay. data. Yeah. Um, because you see, like, like as I said, one of my contractors, he has uh, decided to leave mm. uh, because he says, I'm going to do a course where I can either do it in three months full-time or I do it over nine months uh, part-time. I've decided to do it three months and then come back, reinvent myself, come back and reapply for the role. And I said, goodbye, and I see you in three months' time. You know, So mm-hmm. he's going off to do a data analytics course. Now, that is so, so critical because we will know now, whether it's got AML or any of the compliance, or even if, even if it's business development or anything, mm-hmm. data is king. How do you data. manage data? How do you manage data? And if you say to me, if this guy comes back to me and says, Ross, I finished the course in three months and I've got a good understanding of data and, you know, Previously, we were doing this way. And now, because of my data analytical skill sets that I've acquired, paid by the Skills for Futures course, whatever mm-hmm. funding or whatever, <laughs> yeah. I can now propose a solution that we can do it better and smarter. He puts that in a CV or he calls me up or he calls my, 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 my team leader and tells that, are you not, I'm going to go like, wow, because you see, it's so tangible now. It's so tangible because he knew, he know, he knows what, he knows what the processes were. Mm. how they sucked. He mm. then goes out, get that skill set, and then immediately transfers that skills, the new skill set that is acquired mm. and telling me what value is going to add to my unit tomorrow if I give him, a, give him a chance to return. I might say, well, why not? If it's a contract role, why not? Mm. If it's a permanent role, why not more? You know what I mean? Yeah. But it's for him now that the ball is in his court. Go okay. out. Go and invent yourself, you know? This this case that you just mentioned was, mm. I mean, uh, if uh, if it's real life, uh, it's real life case. This person used to be an ex colleague within the team. Is it? Is, is it that? Is yeah, that yeah. It? he okay. was an ex colleague doing something okay. very mundane and monotonous, and he was always okay. complaining. Uh, you know me. Okay. So he decided to go off, and he was in a contract. He decided to go off because he says, "Wow, well, this is so tedious and this is so monotonous." Mm. But he also understood the value of data. He understood the value of data analytics and how the data analytics can do process re-engineering. How yeah. can it make less mundane, less monotonous, more yeah. collaborated? So he's going to go off, get that skill set because data analytics, uh, listen, we're not going to be able to teach you how to do data because we are not data people. We are yeah. compliance people. But he should come back and he should tell me or my team leader, this is what I've learned and this is how we can, can apply. That's great. So, so that- Im- immediately he can yeah. value. Okay, so from from what you're saying, this would be for our friends who are here today, who are mm. maybe in compliance. This could mm. be very useful in terms of what's next for me. What can I learn? Yeah. What can I pick mm. up next for me? But then, if I come back to the NTUC people, the the, the pivoters, for example, mm. um, say I've been doing this quality assurance thing, and then mm. I took data, right? 
But then there's nothing that says compliance in general. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Would you okay. recommend would you recommend them to do something just to, you know, just put that or even get yeah. through the, the system, you know, they get where's the compliance and the system just throws you out, you know? Um would, would there be anything that you would recommend for these people in terms of getting some some material yeah. into the CV? Just get yeah, just get to some this why I said, for example, if these are the pivoters who have uh, uh don't want to check chicken cell by date, they've got a, a data analytics course under their belt. What mm. would be interesting is if they've also done maybe a, a short contract where they have been with, with working at to do remediation work, or they've also done this very mundane work, which that means you see they've got actually on the job experience also. Then they want to move to the next organization, either for better opportunities or a better chance of getting permanent con con conversion. At least they will say, chicken cell bite date for 10 years. I did a course. I did some maybe some compliance course also, but I've also got OJT on the job experience already. Okay, I did six months with this particular bank, and I remediated with a team of hundred uh, one thousand uh, CDD profiles. My team was doing it. That already gives you an edge because you the chicken cell by cell date is in a sense has already been transferred mm. to the remediation work experience that you've already got for only just six months. But now I say, wow, I need this guy because he has both new skills, mm. but he's also got transferred skills. So I would definitely right. look at his profile mm. because he's shown a, a commitment to reinvent himself. He's taken the, what I call the, uh, managing his expectation to take the, to, to take uh, the, what I call the cost benefit analysis, the expertise analysis. He has done the six months of uh, uh, remediation work as a contractor. Mm. Now he is he's really evidencing a real commitment, a real uh, attitude and enthusiasm for what he wants for to do thing. next. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That is his end goal, you know? Okay. Mm. And then, I guess, as I said, time flies when you're having fun. But I want to ask, um, just in summary, right, mm. for the, for, for I guess, for people who are, like, really determined to get into this space, regardless yeah. of how uh, humbling, whatever it might be, mm. those roles are, what would you say, um, again, just to summarize, right, mm. what would you say are some of the um, the roles that are kind of like lower barriers to entry for people, you know, who, who don't, who say that they want to get into this space, you know? Uh, what, would you say are some of the lower barrier entry roles? So I, I, I said, for example, I worked with the bank, they were looking for a lot of name screeners, but apart from that, anything else that that you see, you know, could be um, yeah, low-hanging low hang, low fruit, you know? Yeah. yeah. Um, um, banks and financial institutions looking for remediation, staff to do just remediation, uh, people to do uh, quality assurance, control testing, sample testing, uh, mm. people who can do uh, uh, data mining, uh, people who can crunch numbers, come up with solutions, you know, mm. uh, yeah. especially in the, from the compliance point of view and not from the IT point of view because, you know, IT doesn't understand us, you know. <laughs> they don't understand us. They will tell, us, tell me what you want and I tell them and they say, we don't understand you. So someone who can bridge the gap between compliance and technology, that means you, you put a technology spin on compliance, you know. So yeah. these are very interesting roles where they are actually entry level roles and very easy to make your make your mark because the skill sets are are required. I need I need people to remediate my back my backlog. I need people to do QA. I need people to do sample testing. I need people who can speak AML tech. I need people who can do data. I can I need people who can analyze and mine data mine and analyze data and come up with some logical. I don't know what document request, SQLs, or whatever. Not yeah. fancy, but someone who can make some sense out of just data. You know what I mean? Yeah, I That's very you. critical, yeah. Okay, so mm -hmm. that means data is one thing. And then my last question before we hit the, the Q&A, uh, mm -hmm. Rose, is on, on the topic of data, but but broad now, yeah. now the, the bigger brother of tech, for example. Now, tech has made the world more convenient. It's also made the world more dangerous in yeah. some sense, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. How How is just technology uh, impacted your life, you know, in your professional life, huh? your professional mm -hmm. life. How is it, how is it, um, yeah, impacted your, your, what you do for a living, you know, has it made it easier? Has it made it more complicated? Uh, and, and so on and so forth. Well, tech has been, it's so wonderful in the sense that it's, transform, it's very transformative. Mm -hmm. All right. Yeah. It has completely transformed the way we do everything. Even the way we do AML controls, how we make sure compliance uh, is adhered to. But the same point is that tech has also been used and deployed and misused and abused mm -hmm. by the bad actors. Yeah. So just say in the, let's say in the space of crypto, 
The problem with crypto is that the people who are using the crypto products, the crypto channels, are smarter than us, the compliance officers. All right, they are smarter. So yes, for every guy who is doing a product on a crypto a platform, say, let's say even NFTs, non-fungible, or whatever, T's, tokens, yeah. Tokens, yeah. I mean, yes. So th those guys, every time you create a product, the, there is a bad actor on the other side who knows how to take advantage of that same NFT, the mm -hmm. loopholes, mm -hmm. and use it for a nefarious and sinister purpose. Yeah. How do you, not even, not just for compliance, how do you not only just keep up with the technology advancement and the transformation that the technology brings is how do we get better get and more better, smarter yeah. than the bad actors? Because they are smarter than us. They yeah. know the technology, they've embraced the technology and they move ahead. I mean, talk about, forget about crypto, even hacking. You've seen the movies, correct? Yeah. How can compliance or even IT security mm. manage the risk of hacking? or ransomware, or whatever it is happening. I mean, we read in the newspaper about a law firm in Singapore was held to ransomware. I just realized, oh my God, they are lawyers, therefore they're first stupid. For sure, you know what I mean? When it comes to technology, we are stupid. But so my point is this, technology has changed us, but technology is also being leading us, leading us through some hoops that we don't even know how to manage and navigate. Yeah. Yeah. So we need to learn. We need to learn and we need to stop. We need to break down the walls and especially yeah. for me, yeah. the barriers to understand what technology is can and can be abused, how it can be abused. I yeah. think that's very good, useful. Uh, I mean, apart from the data thing, I think mm -hmm. also good for um, you know people then to take awareness of the impact of technology. And then again, mm -hmm. if they want to invest a bit of skills future into something, something yeah. with that you know currency of, of technology would be Correct. very useful. Yeah. So IT security, so cyber security, these are very hot also. They're, they're usually outside compliance, but it's a very big area for in, in financial institutions and even big organizations and including law firms, how to manage your data, how to protect your data, how to protect especially prior, uh, personal information, confidential information. Like remember the MOE stuff where all the parents and the, some of the information has been leaked out because of some hacking. Mm. I mean, I'm sure MOE has been thinking, oh my God, what happened? You know what I mean? Yeah. We need to be we need to be smarter than the crooks. Smarter. That's what I'm trying to say. Yeah. But we are yeah. not. We're they're always playing catch nimble, up. You know? yeah, they're, they're nimble. We are playing catch up all the time. And it's always after the event are so we should have done that. Oh, but it's a bit too late, correct? Yeah. Yeah, I know. I know what you mean. Okay, so we have now a bunch of questions that we can answer. Sure. We again, I, I can't promise that we're gonna answer all. Uh, but sure. thank you so much for for putting the questions, guys. At this juncture as well, as I'm taking these questions, um, can I ask one of my colleagues to just launch that poll? Um, for for folks who know us, um, the the the, the poll that we run for our sessions are very, immensely useful for us. Um, they will take you literally fifteen seconds. You know, uh, but it will mean uh, a world to us because it, it kind of helps us understand uh, whether you enjoyed the session and whether you you know you this was informative, useful for you, and then whether or not the advice that you've, you've heard you can take away something uh, from it. Now I'm gonna let you guys do it as I said. Now less than thirty seconds, fifteen thirty seconds max. Um, while I do these questions, okay, Ross. Um, yeah, so, sure. Okay, let me let me let me curate the questions. How about this one first from uh, Olina? Hi, Olina. Thank you so much for um for uh, putting your question. Olina asked this question, Ross. What is your mm -hmm. career advice for existing compliance for co existing compliance manager for career progression? Should we focus in one SEC area to be to be a specialist or try different areas to be a generalist? Mm, tough question. I mean, I, I, I don't know what, what you, you want to answer to this one. Okay. Uh, question is, do you want to be a GP or do you want to be a, a specialist? Specialist. I mean, you want to be a specialist, then you have to acquire the skills. But... Uh, don't knock the general generalists also in compliance because I am always, I'm a specialized person and therefore now I've come to a point where I can don't seem to be able to do non fcc or non-AML work. Right, right. So, so you have to decide what do you want your uh, future trajectory to be? Mm. Do you want to be head of compliance? Do you want to be a compliance risk manager? Do you want to be CEO? Then you need to know the full suite of compliance. Right. But if you say, listen, I'm going to live and die by AML, then specialize right, 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 then specialize. be specialist yeah so it's okay. up to you what do no you want to door. be no wrong yeah. door, basically right just choose okay. your choose your poison that's what i'm saying choose your poison you know yeah mm. oh okay this is interesting hi ross thanks for sharing the tips i was fortunate to attend your classes for the acam singapore aml regime exam uh, for people mm. who are in the same role for a while when do you know when it is time to start looking for a new role mm. 
when you realize that you are not adding any value. Okay. For me, I get bored very easily. Okay. Okay, like people also throw me out. But no, if I find that I'm not adding value, if if I create a policy, let's say a pet policy, and no one is listening to it, no one is implementing it, they just want to do the same old, same old. Yeah, same old, same then, old. Yeah. Then, then what's the value? What's I'd rather the, yeah. go to a place and help them set up, start up. Yeah. And and as one of my uh, one of the places I went to, the, the the hook for me was Ross. We need to evolve because we just came up from an inspection. We right. need to in- right. evolve. Can you help us in the evolution? And I said, sure, I'll walk over because I was doing the same old same old in my previous place, and therefore now the opportunity to add value, that means recreate even the new set of policies, excited me. You know because I like policy work. Okay, so that's what you have to see is are you adding value? Do you feel happy? Do you feel yeah. happy when you go home? And do you feel happy coming back to work? Because, well, guess what? I'm not going to reinvent the back policy. Or you say, oh my God, no one is listening to me. No one's talking to me. No one is even reading my documents. Because that's the way it is. Then move on, yeah. you know? Mm. Yeah, yeah. Okay, cool. Um, I think the only thing I'd like to add is make sure that you are in the right space or you have the right uh, the right resources for you to make that jump. As in, yeah, yeah, you know, yeah, 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 yeah. If you leave the job, right? Okay. Um. Rachel has a very easy question. Um, uh, thanks for sharing, Ross. How about audit and assurance in terms of moving into compliance? I mean, yeah. I'm going to say yes, lah, right? <laughs> Definitely, because this goes under the broad umbrella of QA or yeah. sample testing. Yeah. Uh, usually, auditors, uh, usually we always tell people, auditors can become compliance officers, so can compliance officers become auditors because compliance officers have the subject matter expertise, but mm. audit has the risk management experience and, and they know what to do, what to look up for. They know how to kick the tires. But to move into from audit to compliance, you may not be able to do advisory from day one, but you start maybe with the, the second line of defense monitoring and mm. testing program. You may want to do uh, lead a team of QA. You may want to do control testing. You no, know, no, the internal uh, self-assessment and test that. Yes. Bring, bring in your audit skills first and then move up to advisory because you don't have the uh, experience or the, the the way to manage a client, the stakeholders on a one-to-one case. Can we bring in the client? Can we bring in mm. this pro- Can we do this product? The advisory part you may not have because you are so based on you're always third line. So coming through the remit, com- coming through the uh, compliance uh, program, monitoring and testing program, etc. Yeah. Okay, Ken. Um, here's another one. Um, don't know whether or not it's, it's going to be um, something that we already covered, but maybe you can expand. Uh, this anonymous uh, person asks, uh, how is AML slash transaction monitoring impacted by cryptocurrency? I mean, is that something that you, you, you feel that you can take? Or yeah, no, no, it's the same thing. It's the same thing. It's called fun flow, correct? Except that in transaction monitoring, we're always looking at post-monitoring, post-transaction. Uh, it's easy when you're talking about a traditional bank or a traditional FI, because as I mentioned, all of them are fiat, which means what? Money in, money out. When you go into the crypto space, you are talking about both fiat, which is the currency, dollar mm-hmm. cents, and you're also talking about the crypto, which is the, the token or, or whatever, the NFTs or whatever. Mm-hmm. So you in a crypto space, your transaction monitoring has to be at two levels. Mm-hmm. The money that goes in, the fiat, which is the uh, ramp, what you call the on-ramping. Then the crypto, 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 crypto. And when the crypto goes out of the system as an mm-hmm. off-ramp, Okay, so you have to do monitoring at two and two aspects. One is the fiat in, fiat out, and then in between the crypto. Okay, right? Mm. So transition monitoring becomes a little bit more difficult. That's why for MES purposes, it's no longer transfer of funds, it's a transfer of value. So they right. under the Payment Services Act, uh, they don't talk about a wire transfer because there's no wire transfer in crypto. The wire transfer, if at all, is just from the on-ramping or the off-ramping. Mm. But in between, you're talking about the a movement between one wallet and another wallet, correct? That's a whole new game. But adding that is transferring value. So how does transaction monitoring change when you go from traditional banking or financial institutions to a crypto space? Got it. Okay. Yeah. Go and look at the Payment Services Act. MES has given good uh, indication on what is the difference, what's the delta when you move from a traditional bank, MES 626, to say Payment Services Act or PSN01 and N02. Okay. Mm. Got it. Got it. Okay, and um, there's this one uh, question that asks, uh, Hi, Ross, can I ask what are transferable skills as a compliance AML transaction monitoring officer? Uh, what are some of the exit opportunities? Really appreciate if you can share. Sure. Transaction monitoring, the greatest and the most important, the most important trajectory is AML investigation. 
to become the MLRO, Money Laundering Reporting Officer, or the Money Laundering Reporting, uh, the delegate. That means you do the alerts, you send it to someone else, correct? Be that someone else. Usually you have the L1, L2, and then you have the L3. L3 is usually the country MLRO or the country AML compliance officer or the compliance team. The guys who actually draft the SDRs, the guys who actually file the SDR, the guys who actually recommend the exit, the guys who take on the business when the business refuses to listen to you. The guys who know risk, that's what you need to be. From a transaction monitoring analyst, close alert, close open alert, close an alert, escalate, escalate, escalate. Be the person at the end who decides from risk. What is the risk to this bank and how am I going to manage that risk for this bank? Mm. Okay, fight with the, that's where you fight with the business every day. Mm. Okay, uh, this one, this next question is really good uh, because it was um, originally something that we, that I thought about. Um, mm. What is your advice for a career change as an RM, as an RM, so probably mm. this person referring to sales, to compliance? I mean, I, I can okay. see some transferability. What, what are your thoughts? Oh, definitely. In fact, my team right now has a RM from commercial banking who decided to say, I'm going to do mobility and came over. Guess what is he doing now? Private bank AML. He is now taking on the bank, uh, the, the RMs in private banking on CDD. Because you see, on the sales part, he would have done some KYC unhappily as a chore. But when you come over to the compliance part, you still have to do the CDD, but from the second line of defense. So he should now, he is now acquiring the skills and he's now demonstrating the skills that what I thought was a chore, I now see the value. Why I need to know, like say, the client's source of wealth, why I need to know the client's source of funds, I need to challenge the client's information. And now MES says, dubious documents. How am I, the bank, satisfied that whatever the documents given by the client through the RM is kosher? You know what I mean? So yeah. it's a nice way of moving in because you already have some skill set. You are doing the work but from a different point of view, from the first line of defense. Mm. Now you're moving to second line of defense. Mm. Just build on it. Build on that. Okay? And show your experience. Say how many files you did and talk about the, the, the more difficult files that you did and try to be AML darling. You know what I mean? You know, mm. when I was in RM, this is the kind of case I told you guys, you know. Then you say, wow, he's one of us. You see, mm. you got to show your your value that you added. If you if you're the right. one of person is, I really hate you guys, but now I want a job. I want to come over to you. Why would I want to take you? You have not been a champion. You have not been an AML champion when you were an RM. Mm. Show me that you're an AML champion. Then okay. I will give you the chance. Yeah. Yeah, that's awesome. Mm. I'm gonna end. I guess it's three thirty already. So I want to end with the longest question I I see so far, mm. which you can see as well. The first one. Uh, mm -hmm. This sounds like more like a statement, but maybe the, um, he or she mm -hmm. is looking for a reiteration or a, a, mm -hmm. maybe a statement on your side. So I'm a product manager, not wanting to go into compliance, but because I have a lot of interactions with compliance folks, mm -hmm. um, I wanted to understand my colleague better in terms of what they do. Also, since I'm the first line of defense, I had to learn to do a source of wealth and source of funds mm -hmm. and corroboration of reports. Hence, I'm here to learn how to wear the risk hat. And so mm. working with compliance need not to be complicated or frustrating. So maybe they're looking for a vote of encouragement from you. <laughs> from you. No, no, no. Yeah. No, that's why I said everyone's responsibility is risk management, correct? Yeah. Whether it is compliance or whether it's outsourcing risk, technology risk, everyone is managing risk. For so if you've got a product manager or a product, uh, uh, what do you call uh, uh, in development, Understand what is the risk in that product development, not just AML, not just compliance. There's so much of risk, marketing risk, whether or not I can even sell it to Taiwanese because you know the cross-border mm. rules. Understand what is the risk that needs to be managed and whether yeah. or not those risks either exist or are mitigated by the bank's control or the financial institution's control. Mm. So compliance is only managing risk. Of course, we have to follow the rules, but the rules are basically risk management. You know what I mean? Yeah. So. Yeah. Understand why you're doing what you're doing, okay? Then only you'll understand why compliance insists that you do what you're doing, you know what I mean? So it's gotcha. very important to, to, un, to wear the hat of risk manager, then only you can appreciate why compliance is being such a meow, you know what I mean? Because, you know, they always don't like compliance because they say, you guys are not, you're not enablers. You're always saying no. You never say yes. You never say, say yes. Uh, yeah. yeah, we never say yes, but I say no, we always say yes, no, but, huh? look for that but. Yeah. What is the risk that we sought to be managed and how we can manage it? I never say no, but I want to know why I'm going to, I'm going to ask you, what are you going to do to help me manage that risk for the bank? You know? Yeah. So it's always Got no it. but. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm.
Got it. Mm. Um, okay, so at, at this juncture, um, we have to, we're going to wrap up because um, mm. it's been a full hour and obviously some people can only stay for the hour. Um, I want to say a few things. Uh, obviously, the first one is obviously to you, Ross. Uh, I really enjoyed the session because it's so organic. Um, and uh, you you managed, I, I, I thought of questions and you reacted to these questions brilliantly. So thank you so much for that. For the people who attended here today, who are here today, I hope you managed to take some lessons away. Um, as I was telling Ross, maybe like a few days ago, the hallmark of a good session is when you guys attend and you can leave with something tangible that you can work on, think about, or, you know, rejig in terms of your own career processes. So I hope that we have achieved that to a certain extent. I also want to thank my colleague um, in the background who's been scribing in the, mm. the, the, the summary in, in the chat box. Also, she left an email address for people who are new to us, who don't know us, who want to get a, you know, sort of like a one-to-one -one appointment with uh, one of the career advisors. Please write to the email that she has uh, supplied in the chat box. Um, and if you do that, we'll, we'll try to secure you the first you know, uh, appointment uh, available to see one of us privately so that we can talk about your own, um, your own career uh, issues. And so I guess now, Ross, the last question would just be a final one, which is, uh, do you have any sort of last words for people here, regardless of where they are in the career? It could be a junior person, mid-career person, you know, a late careerist, for example. I mean, is there anything you want to leave with, leave them with before, before we end the session? Two points. Mm. Be courageous. Two, mm. be confident. That's all. Courageous, confident. Courageous and confidence. That's all that's required. Yeah. Yeah, I guess uh, for, for, for those people uh, who, who are here, um, I'm just going to add in one more thing and be confident, be courageous and uh, have a really good network of people <laughs> out there, <laughs> you know, come see a coach. You know, I, I have to say yeah. that because, yeah. you know, right? yeah. <laughs> come see a coach. Yeah. yeah. And um, we wish you all the very, very best in your career. Um, I also want to say that even though you're in your rooms watching this alone, you are not really alone. If you have any issues, there will always be a body of people here out there, up here, who are willing to help you. So uh, take the first step, come and see uh, some of us and stay tuned for our next programming. Um, we have a lot more guests uh, like Ross. So subscribe and uh, we'll see you in the next, um, the, the next, uh, the next session.